It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 51, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. My guest today is John Bierenbaum. John is a professor in the Department of Horticulture at Michigan State University. He spent most of his career working with farmers to develop practical solutions to the challenges faced by small-scale organic farmers with research into high tunnels, compost production, organic transplants, intensive vegetable production, and organic soil management. He was instrumental in starting MSU's Student Organic Farm and the Associated Organic Farmer Training Program there. We dig into the economics and practicalities of worm compost, including methods for low-input, low-energy worm composting through the winter. We talk about doing some research on your farm and how to take an approach to that without getting too bogged down in the details. And we take a look at how farmers can do a better job of transplant production by optimizing the greenhouse environment and developing a transplant production action plan. I've worked with John in a variety of capacities now for about 15 years, and I'm always impressed with the practical, farmer-focused approach he takes to research and teaching. Enjoy the show. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop-growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high-quality composts and compost-based living soils for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com Bandwidth for the Farmer to Farmer podcast is provided by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are versatile, maneuverable in tight spaces, lightweight for less compaction, and easy to maintain and repair on farm. Gear-driven and built to last for decades of dependable service. BCSAmerica.com. John Bierbaum, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Hello, Chris. It's a pleasure to be talking with you this morning. Thanks for making the time on a Saturday morning. I think you must be like most farmers and and have enough work that you wake up on Saturday and just get right to it. I do. I already uh, got online and uh, got in touch with the students because they have something due today and giving them an update. So I'm ready to go. All right. I've given a little bit of background about about you and, and your work, but I'd love to hear it in your own words about all of the ways that you're involved, or at least some of the ways that you're involved, because I think we did all of the ways that you're involved. We'd be 90 minutes getting there. Um, but some of the ways that you're involved in the in the world of farming and organic agriculture, and, and you've got a couple of different farming operations that you're involved in. And so if you could just kind of lay that out for us, that would be great a great way to start the show. Sure, Chris. I'm happy to do that. You know, I think it reflects both the, you know, the way that I learn and the way that I like to know things in order to be able to teach is by doing. So uh, our family is fortunate that uh, after doing several fix-up houses that you you know make a little money, uh, we about 18 years ago, we got to buy the 10-acre piece of property that we're only about uh, 10 miles from campus, but we're you know definitely out in the country enough to, to be nice and quiet and uh, we've got a, a one acre pond, which is pretty unique on the, it's a man-made pond, but it's uh, beautiful. I'm sitting here looking out the window at it now. Um, we've developed about two to three acres of uh, fenced in pasture um, because my wife, uh, Patty, is particularly into uh, animals. And it all started out with uh, llamas and doing a 4-H llama group and ended up into sheep. And then uh, she really enjoys doing the fiber. She does all the collecting of the fiber and then uh, used to process it, but sends it off to be processed. So we have that going. And then uh, also with the horses, she and uh, my uh, elder son uh, both really got into horses. And let's see, what else do we have? I've right now I have about a quarter acre or so of various gardens from fruit trees to perennials and annuals and flowers at some point in the past it was up as high as half an acre uh, and then the back of our property uh, has a, a wood lot that uh, has been very nice but most of it was ash and so a lot of it is dead or dying now so mostly they have a lot of firewood so uh, we're not really doing much co- for commercial sale here but it's a great opportunity to learn i guess i should mentioned I do have a 20 by 60 hoop house where I get to grow a lot of our own food, but I also get to experiment with stuff. Um, as I said, that I don't usually, I tell people not to do, and then I do it to see what happens. And we've got worms in there, and I've got a big worm manure for the horse piles, and all the horse manure gets put on the pastures. So it's just a great learning experience. Uh, my other, this was kind of the prototype because the other big learning experience was the student organic farm on campus, which started out at just a few acres with the uh, high tunnel 
research in 2001 was the first year we built the high tunnels. And by 2003, we started the uh, 48 week CSA and we uh, have grown now to there's about 15 acres there, uh, about seven half acre fields that are in rotation for the vegetable production. There's a, a half acre edible forest garden that was part of a research project that students get some experience in. There's about seven high tunnels, which uh, is, totals to about half an acre. Um, what else do we got there? We've got uh, uh, one acre, a very large field that's a little more commercial production, about three acres of pasture where they've done some uh, beef cattle and as well as the, uh, the swine project. So lots of opportunities to learn there. For me, it was really getting to do the hoop houses and doing them year after year and figuring out the rotations and figuring out the fertility and what can go wrong. So it uh, not replicated experiments there, but just uh, replicated over time and paying attention to what's going on and trying things out. And the last five years there, I've added the, uh, the uh, food scrap composting project, which you know, has a footprint of maybe half an acre or so. We have a 30 by 72 hoop house that's filled with about half a million uh, red wigglers that uh, we've been learning. We gradually grew those up from just uh, maybe 40 pounds or so that I brought from home here. And and uh, I would say that there's probably, uh, how many pounds do we say there is? There's probably about 500 pounds of worms there now. And uh, then we built a cement pad and put a hoop house on it. So then we take deliveries of the food scraps. We can easily mix them up and pre-compost them prior to giving to the worm. So that's been my laboratory of sorts for uh, the last five years or home away from home. I'm really not involved in the day-to-day -day management of the student farm much anymore, but I get that's something to keep me busy there with uh, paying attention to the worms and trying to figure out uh, the worms, which I think we'll talk about a little later in the interview. I think it's really cool, John, how, how you're very grounded in, in what you're doing as a researcher there at Michigan State University that you know, we, we first got involved with each other when I invited you to come speak at the Organic University at the Moses Organic Farming Conference back in the, well, it would have been the early part of the last decade and the early part of the aughts. And, and we, um, and you came in and talked about transplant production and it was just so immediately apparent to me that, like you just said, you know, you're not out there doing triple replicated trials. You're out there actually figuring out what works on a farm scale and, you know, screwing things up, making mistakes, figuring out how to fix them, figuring out how you could have avoided them in the first place. And I just, I really like that. Um, and it's something I'm always talking to clients about. You know, we, we look at a lot of situations on farms that I go on where I'm like, wow, you know, if you put on some more, you know, you're not putting on enough fertility, you're not putting on enough water. What would happen if you did that? I, I always say, you know, do a bed, right? I mean, how how do you guys how do you do that within your university setting? Because I know you're not getting publishable material necessarily out of that because you don't have the again the triple replicated trials and statistical analysis and all of that. But when you're actually setting up and saying, you know, what what happens if we do this treatment versus this treatment? How does that how does that work at a really practical level? To help fill in a little background, it's like at MSU. I uh, as of August first of last year, I've got thirty years in here plus. Uh, four years before that as a grad student, but I must have two careers here at MSU. And my first career, while my primary appointment was teaching, I did a lot of research with the greenhouse industry into looking at uh, potting media and irrigation water and fertilizer. And I had uh, several masters and PhD students. And you know, we did the publication route and uh, pretty proud of the, you know, the record of publications that are out there and information that was shared that really helped the greenhouse industry but one of the things i learned is is that it you know it takes a lot of time to take that data from you know completing the experiment to really getting the publications done and as i went through my transition there uh, around 1994 95 when i took my first sabbatical and started looking at you know what was i going to do next it was you know this project on the edible flowers came along and shifted me into uh, food production. And that's what brought me to the first uh, Upper Midwest Organic Farming Conference that time was, you know, saying, 
you know, wanting to learn about organic. But in my mind, there's a sense of urgency here of what we need to know and how we need to help farmers. And I'm for me, it's a I guess a big a 10 year experiment of, you know, not doing emphasizing the publications and trying to get the information and get it out there. It certainly does not uh, garner me much you know, res respect, or it's not the kind of thing that the university is looking for. But, you know, I did what the university was looking for for the first 10 years and got to be a full professor. So I, I did what I needed to. And I guess I'm willing to take the chance of doing something different here and seeing what works again, because I, I think it's what's needed that we just need to move quicker and we need to be helping farmers figure out how to be successful with the whole local food. Um, and the hoop houses have been a big part of that. And um, you know, I guess I like when someone describes me as uh, maybe more as a catalyst for helping do that. There are already people doing the uh, hoop houses, but what really people needed to have available was to be able to see the hoop houses work. And that's what we set up at the student farm. And we've brought hundreds of people through there. And you've probably seen that where they walk in and they're looking around and everything's green in the middle of winter. And it's like, well, where's the heater? And, you know, that was 15 years ago, but you know, now, you know, it's, we have hundreds of hoop houses in Michigan. And part of it was because of that catalyzing that by helping people to see it. And, the same thing like you interviewed Colin about the farm up in the UP and you know he's doing a great job of growing vegetables and just seeing that so people can come there and see well there's really not a limitation to growing vegetables in the UP other than knowledge and experience and having the right cultivars and having the right plan and you know you can grow beautiful vegetables there it's it's kind of like a, a build it and they will come approach or you know don't tell people how to do things, but let people see it and let them figure it out for themselves. And you know that might be a quick aside there that you know how I approach teaching. Uh, I'm not I, I used to be. I try now not to be the person that just stands up there and uh, the sage on the stage kind of giving the information. Uh, I like to have the students or in the workshops where I'm giving some information, but asking questions and helping people to uh figure things out for themselves it's what uh is known as socratic teaching or maudic teaching you know helping people birth the ideas and uh some other traditions it's called coyote teaching uh you know but helping people to see things helping people to figure them stuff out and then you know providing key information and i've got to see if i can pull back to your question of you know <laughs> people doing the you know the asking themselves, you know, on their own farms about, you know, what can I try that's different? You know, what have I read about that I want to try? And, you know, don't bet the farm on something new, but take some small spaces and do something. Um, but keep in mind, you need to have something to compare it to. It's when somebody takes, you know, the whole farm or the whole hoop house and they shift from doing Let's say they want to apply I don't know, rock phosphate or, or compost. And when you treat the whole thing, you really don't have a way of knowing what the result was, you know, unless you leave some part that wasn't treated. And that seems to be something that the uh, SARE, you know, farmer projects and, you know, other things that have encouraged farmers to do research, you know, help them to be aware of that. That how do you set something up so that you can make a comparison? and actually know whether it had an effect or not. Yeah, that's great. I mean, any any thoughts about like how much to either treat or leave untreated? Does it I mean, when you're when you're trying to get real practical on the ground research results, is that I mean, is it is it something where it's necessary to have equal plot sizes or do you recommend like trying it with a tenth or I mean, is there is there a number or or is there just doing what seems like the right thing? Kind of going with your gut instinct. My first answer would be more, you know, the latter that you can intuitively, you know, assess how much is it going to take for me to, to know whether this worked or not, that, you know, we have to be careful with fertility treatments and, you know, realizing how far roots can go and that they can have an effect uh, at, at longer distances. And, you know, that was one of the critiques that I've read about of the, the long-term trials and, 
in England that I'm forgetting the name of right now that uh, went on for decades and you know about were the plots big enough. So that's important for fertility, but for some other things in terms of uh, light or watering or temperature, you know, you have to just think about what the the size is of plot or group of plants is necessary, you know, so that you can be fairly confident. And, you know, that confidence in normal replicated trials comes by uh, having independent treatments and doing it all at once. Um, Whereas the other way of doing that replication is doing it over time. We're actually, uh, I have a PhD student now who's uh, in her fourth year of the project and she's going straight through. She didn't do a master's, she's just doing uh, the PhD. And um, with the compost work, we wanted to do these 10 different compost treatments and it was difficult to replicate that. It would be 30 different uh, compost piles. So in that particular experiment, we did the 10 treatments in 2013, 14, and 15. And that's, I think, going to give us even more power to look at how did they turn out over time. And with each of the composts, we used a similar recipe. And we have uh, the analysis from it. And then we're growing transplants in those composts. And somebody else is taking the compost and looking at the microorganisms from a compost heap perspective. So. It's going to be harder to publish, but uh, you know she also has an experiment where you know we did twelve compost piles with four different treatments and three replications, so that you know that all happened at, at one time. But it's again figuring out what gives you confidence and being okay that that confidence may come over time and over seasons. And uh, I think that's what I've been looking at and working on and. Um, I think farmers appreciate that type of uh, outcome or uh, observations because it you know, re reflects a lot how they learn. I, I know just enough about doing things like statistical analysis to be really, really dangerous. Um, I was I was around and 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 tangentially involved with with graduate students and and research, um, but only as an undergrad. So I never really got that into it. But I know that I know in in the research world there's this thing called this confidence interval. And I think I think about that for farmers that you know when you try something and it works, like you know say I say I take one bed out of a hundred and I and I double my fertilizer on it and I go wow I got great yields that was perfect I'm you know how do I how, how do you advise people or how do you look at something and say, yes, I now have enough information to say this is something that actually works and I'm going to apply it across the whole farm instead of, you know, maybe it was just an aberration or, you know, or, 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 may, you know, I, well, I'll just leave it at, I'll just leave it at how do you know that it's time to apply it across the whole farm? Again, that's the sense of confidence that can, is part objective you know do you have numbers to uh, that you can actually demonstrate it and but then there's the part that's subjective or intuitive and you know that's the part that makes researchers the standard research is really uncomfortable because we're taught that you know we need to really know you know by doing this research and and um, some would go to the extreme of it, it, it's not a factor, it's not known unless it's been published in a peer-reviewed journal. And um, for me, in my journey, is partly, you know, challenging or questioning that way of approaching things that it clearly has value, but we need other ways of doing things and trusting your own intuition and uh, it's I use that phrase sometimes around campus of other ways of knowing and it get really uh, funny faces that people make because it just really that's not something that they're used to thinking about but uh, we're not going to get into that today but there are other ways <laughs> of knowing things but it's in, in having some self-confidence and, and that's in, in my own personal life that's what I'm that's something that I'm exploring and uh, trying to learn more about that I can eventually share with others and it just I you know, your career what you do I always tell students doesn't define who you are it's uh, it was advice that I was given you know that your career like I'm a horticulturalist it doesn't define who I am but it defines you know the playing field of life 
for me. It defines someone about what I do and who I interact with, but um, who I am is much more than that. And what I'm really interested in these days is helping people with their horticulture or their growing plants, but uh, it's not just about cultivating plants and cultivating the farm. What we're really here doing is cultivating ourselves and cultivating our humanity. And how do we do that uh, together, you know, with what, what we're doing day to day um, for our job and to generate income and to be whatever people would call successful. But, you know, how do we keep growing? And so how I approach the research is somewhat reflective of that my exploring and trying to figure out how, you know, we learn, you know, what works for us in day to day life. Uh, I mean, that's an, uh, I guess an indirect way of answering your question is, you know, we, we try something, let's say when somebody says this particular diet and, you know, we try that and how do we know whether it works? Well, you know, we keep trying other things and eventually you get some confidence of whether it was something specific that happened or whether it's just a more general thing that as long as I'm, doing these things in general, uh, I'm going to be healthier. I think there's a million different diets, but it's, there's basically the idea of being attent attentive to what you're eating is going to make the difference the same way with exercise. Um, you know, but how do we keep improving ourselves, uh, our mind, our body, you know, your spirit and being a better person? And I'm getting off the track here again, but... Uh, yeah, well, but I think I think... I mean, so let's, but let's kind of riff on that and go, you know, you talk about, you talk about something like a different, you know, a diff, different diets and how really what it comes down to is, is, you know, paying attention to what you're eating. And that once you're doing that, you're probably going to be okay, whether, you know, and I, and I've seen this recently, um, you know, I, I'm not farming anymore. And so the, the, the calories, calories in and calories out thing has gotten a little out of balance for me. And I'm actually working on bringing that back into balance now. And it's been an interesting little journey for me, but one of the things that I read that really that really clicked for me is like, okay, look, there's there's a million different things you can do out there at the edge for like these one percent gains, but fundamentally it all comes back to calories in and calories out and eating good food. And I was like, oh, okay, I can do that. You know, I don't have to have like the 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 particular method with the particular guru and the particular vitamin blend or whatever. And and I and I'm wondering about so if I mean so to take that take that and and kind of upscale that to farming. Um, I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways to get it at farming, you know? And I mean, there's, and, and we've had JM Fortier on the, on the program, who's doing, you know, very intensive production, hundred thousand dollar an acre and an acre and a half of production. And, you know, we've also had people like, like John Peterson or Pete Johnson on the program who are farming, uh, you know, I, I think Pete's farming a hundred acres of organic vegetables up there in Northern Vermont. You know, John's doing 30 or 40, you know, on this kind of this, this really large scale, lots of tractors, lots of equipment. And, you know, there's, there's lots of different ways to slice and dice organic market farming. And I'm, and I wonder if, if there are, if you can boil things down or if it, in, in your, in your role as kind of an observer of organic farming, um, if, if there are things that you can boil down commonalities, common themes for organic production at organic vegetable production at any scale, you know, things, I mean, if, or, or within any kind of a model of production, does that make sense? I believe so. And I'll take a stab at that and, you know, step back and start where with what you were saying, you know, about diet and exercise, the, the word that often comes out, and many of the, the gurus that talk about that, you know, is intentionality and, and that and awareness that you're, you know, you're not just, you know, drifting along, doing whatever that you you become intentional in your actions. And I think that that's a huge part that does apply to organic farming. Um, I can one idea that popped into my head is when we look at biodynamic and the use of preparations and where those ideas came from. Uh, and clearly, there are people who have tried them and show how they work, but it's not how they work, but have gotten improved results. And it's unclear how they work. Sometimes we're applying things at very small doses and uh, looking for these effects. But one idea 
when I think about biodynamic is, you know, is the question how much of that is intentionality and, you know, focus on, you know, bringing your thoughts to um, doing the best quality that you can do and um, doing it precisely and, you know, having an expectation of how you want things to come out. And so then to pull that back to your question about the, you know, what's happening with organic farming, I mean, that does seem to be the foundation. Again, I started 20 years ago without a clue um, about organic farming, you know, and then just starting asking questions. I was very fortunate that I did get to go and visit a lot of farms and go to conferences and, you know, people at conferences would talk and share ideas and, you know, that theme, you know, that we know of the, the soil and of, understanding the soil from so many different perspectives. You know, I started out understanding the chemical perspectives of soil. That's what I was taught that three major universities um, didn't really learn much of anything about the biological, but I also know about the, you know, the physical properties and then gradually you learn about the biological and you really get to know soil. And if you work long enough with the soil, you start seeing it not as something, you know, just physical or something that's growing the food, but that, you know, there's something more there. You begin to see the the sacredness of what it is that you're doing. And, you know, that begins to transfer to, you know, the importance of food, which would be the the other really key theme that you would hear, you know, through so many of your interviews. And, you know, it, I, Let's see, I've probably gotten at least 10 or 12 interviews that I've listened to and wished it was more, but taken away so much from those, and I'm sure other people are too. And it, it is that picking through there and hearing what people are saying, um, but the emphasis on doing the best that they can, um, taking care of the soil, understanding the biology, thinking of the farm as this living organism and uh, the other word that I really like is uh, integrating or being integral about all the different aspects and how you can pull those together. And, you know, we can do that on the farm or we can do that for our own personal health. And, um, you know, that's what we're here to do. And it's uh, you can do it by yourself for a while, but it's a lot easier to do it in community, do it with more people. And uh, you know, that's another, I think, big aspect of the organic farming movement is um, it's people trying to do it uh, together and uh, in community and supporting each other. So, you know, those common themes uh, are things that uh, keep us all going during uh, some of the times when uh, we look around us and see uh, a lot of things that are frustrating that are happening that uh, we would rather not see happening. But you know, it's, it's a matter of doing what you can. You know, that was something else I was going to share that uh, when I got into organic farming, part of it was because of my real concern about what was happening with GMOs. It just didn't make sense to me. And it's like, how do you do something about that? And um, the advice that I got was to not spend too much time trying to fight uh, something that's going or trying to change something, just show something that, you know, is different. And that's what the student organic farm for me was about here on campus was, you know, showing people that there are other ways of doing things that we don't have to have GMOs and you know that it's not about trying to feed the world or feeding more people. And the, the whole green revolution thing is flawed that it's, you know, it's about helping people feed themselves and, uh, to me, the student organic farm was a big test of that. And it, you know, within 10 years, it was pretty obvious to me that it worked, you know, that having a vision of what it is that you want to try to accomplish and where do you want to go and then working with other people to do that, you know, that it really can help and happen. And that's, again, back to that intentionality. So hopefully some of that makes sense. Oh, I, I like I mean, I like that. I like especially that that idea of, of the intentionality and then doing doing what you can do. You know, those those both seem like like important things um, from a what you also talked about the soil and and how that is kind of at the root of of all organic farming, whether you're you know, no matter what scale you're operating on. I mean, John, from your perspective, what 
you know, you work with a lot of farmers and, and, and because you're approaching it from that soils perspective. And I think your, your experience with composting and vermicomposting, and even to a certain extent with, with the greenhouse industry and doing transplants and plugs, you have to be kind of hyper aware of what's going on in the soil with that. What, um, what do you see out there that, that a lot of farmers, you know, if, if, if there was a common theme that, that either, either people are doing really well or that people could be doing better when it comes to the soil management? What's jumping into my head here that I may not be a, the exact answer to your question, but uh, is, you know, the big picture of organic farming and what is it are we tr- that we're trying to accomplish here with the, the soil? And it's, it is using cover crops and other things to, to, to feed the microorganisms and to get nutrients available. But, you know, we have to be careful. And it, it's like I was been think thought about this quite a bit. And it's like, particularly for our students that don't have much exposure to agriculture, how can we help them to see this part of the living soil? And what occurred to me through the composting and that we're in normal farming or in farming, we're uh, constantly harvesting and extracting nutrients from the soil. So our goal is, is we have to somehow get those back there, which you can go out and buy something mined or something some fertilizers that's been synthesized, but there's a lot of material that's coming off the land that could go back to the land. And, you know, for centuries, millennia, you know, that was done through animal manures and you know, composting, but we kind of got away from that and uh, read about this, the whole idea of closing the food cycle loop. And uh, that's, We've used that in our work for the last five years. Uh, we got funding from the university to work on that where you know, they have uh, two issues, food waste that's not being eaten, but more importantly, the food scraps. The university seven years ago or so started uh, instead of buying in all the food already prepared, they, you know, they buy a lot of whole food now and they have chefs in every each of the food areas that are preparing things. So uh, there's a lot of scraps. Uh, For the last three years, we've been taking 100,000 pounds of kitchen preparation material. That's just from one of eight food preparation areas. It is is the largest, but that's a lot of pineapple rinds and melons and um, onion skins and poppy grounds and things that are happening in the kitchen. And the way I look at it, the more of that, the better. That's not waste really that's residue that just needs to be recycled. So uh, we started doing it with the worms in part to help again, get attention. I mean, a compost pile is just, it's really exciting to me, but it's only so exciting to people. But when you (laughs) add worms into it and people can see the worms, as I say, sometimes it, you know, it's, it's sexier and it's, it's got some more splash to it so that, uh, John, John, you're probably the only person that would would look at worms and go, "Oh, sexier." Well, it's 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 something more that people can see. <laughs> Sorry about that, but it. Uh, how do we get people to be excited about this? And worms do get people a little bit more excited than a regular old compost pile. So we've been doing this, and what we did was we would take food from the farm up to campus, about five miles, and drop it off, and then we would bring back initially just uh, totes of kitchen preparation material. And eventually now they bring out big dumpsters, you know, with a truck, but we made that in the compost. And then we took that compost up onto a place on campus where we have a hoop house and we filled the foundation of the hoop house with this compost made with food scraps. And for the last four years, we've been growing crops in there that then uh, mostly herbs. And I think you actually got to see that when you visited a few years ago, yeah. go over into the uh, the dorm. And so helping people to see the importance of this closing the food cycle loop and that people can contribute to farms in ways other than being a member of a CSA, like they can be thinking about where uh, their food scraps go and is it possible to get those back to the land or even just back into their own garden. Uh, we've been taking leaves from the city of East Lansing. It's our primary uh, input that we combine the food scraps with, do the pre-composting, um, and then feeding to the worms. And we're making the last two or three years, we've been around 12 to 15 cubic yards of finished worm compost that, you know, potentially has a value of 
four hundred to I know some people could sell it for four thousand dollars in little one pound bags, but it it has value. But we're also showing then how that can come back and be a top dressing on transplants, or how that can be uh, included into the systems. And there's a misperception that worm compost is somehow you know always has so much more fertility. And it's just not the case. And it's a lot of the original worm composting work was done with dairy manure. And, you know, that does have more fertility. But our food scrap leaf worm compost has only moderate fertility. Um, and we can use it at higher percentages. Um, but we also can take that and combine it with other composts and get something that will work as an amendment, which is mostly how people think of compost. But again, to try to get people to understand this big picture, we're actually growing plants in 100% compost. And again, that's not a super new idea because there are people in urban ag around the country doing that, but trying to bring awareness to how that's done and uh, what's necessary to make it possible, including, you know, amending the compost based on soil testing and you know we tend to see for example there can be a lot of potassium there um, but that can go away quickly so we need to compensate for that uh, depending on how mature the compost is there may or may not be nitrogen available and the pH may be too high or too low so really trying to get the details worked out on this um, been using a term to describe it that I think is appropriate and hasn't really been used as uh, compost ponics. So the intentional making of compost for uh, crop production, which, you know, moving from thinking of it as a waste management strategy to a, a resource management strategy, which, you know, there's other people doing this. So it's, it's not a unique thing, but it's, uh, it's kind of where my focus is going in now, particularly working with uh, Brooke, Homer, the graduate student who's working on this project. And so how to make the composts, how to then use the composts. Uh, we've had really good results uh, with that hoop house on campus that uh, we're into year three and we really haven't added fertility and we've grown tomatoes and cucumbers. And I wouldn't have believed that would happen, you know, myself, if you told me three years ago, but it's going to be relevant in uh just to bring in another quick aside here, the, the USDA task force that I'm serving on is uh, thinking about the hydroponics and the aquaponics and, you know, what do we do? And, you know, part of that for me is showing that it can be done with compost, that we don't need, you know, some of these other systems that farmers already are doing this. And we just need some more uh, focus on the compost and getting stuff back. And I'm getting into the rambling thing, but I'm going to make one more point is that I think all of this is particularly relevant to the uh, whole issue of climate change and uh, our environment and getting CO2 out of the atmosphere and back into the soil. Um, we look at the Marin County project out in California where they're experimenting with putting the compost out on the rangelands and the effects that that's having both on uh, carbon from the compost, but also carbon from the grass that's growing. Some beginning evidence to say, you know, it's not going to be a matter of just uh, reducing the amount of fossil fuels, but also how we can use our soil management to get carbon back into the soil uh, there. And, uh, you know, with the farm up in the UP and working with uh, Matt Raven and Jason Roundtree, who are doing the holistic management and the whole uh, with working with the Savory Institute. That's another project that I'm involved in. You know, I'm as excited as ever, you know, about the potential that we have to really make a difference, whether it's at a small scale or a large scale, you know, both from farming, both from the environment, you know, and, you know, as we've been saying, for people to be, you know, better people and to be healthier. So, John, I, I think the, the whole vermicomposting thing is really interesting to me. And, and, and especially, well, I've, I've tried vermicomposting just kind of on a, on a home scale and, and, a, and, a, and a very kind of a, a really half-assed effort on my farm to do some of that. And, and you know, both, both times it's been kind of a failure. Um, 
but I'm I'm really interested in what what you're talking about about the doing it as a as kind of a secondary processing. So can you? But but I want to talk first. I mean, is it worth it? I mean, you talk about. I mean, I know there's a question: Is composting on farm composting worth it as an activity? You know, or is it better just to focus on the farm and buy in the compost? And and I and then I'd kind of ask that same question about the vermicompost. Uh, I mean, that's a lot of work, and you know, it's it's another thing to be managing on a vegetable farm that's already full of things to manage. Lots of great questions there, and particularly you know the the idea of you know when do you do the composting versus when do you buy the compost and uh, I think you have a lot of beginning farmers uh, or new farmers uh, listening to the podcast and you know early on you know it's buying in compost is probably the thing to do if you have access to it which you know that's a big lots of times that access isn't there though but that stimulates you know why i'm doing what i'm doing is to try to find ways to do the composting so that it is simple enough and straightforward enough that a farmer can have the time to do it on farm and uh been working on the hot composting for some time and, and offering systems that work well and can work quickly uh the worm composting it was a case of looking at what people were selling worm compost for which can easily be 10 times as much or more so if we say regular compost might sell for five to fifty dollars a cubic yard worm compost can easily go for you know five hundred to five thousand dollars a cubic yard and and i'm asking myself you know is this just the case of the market you know that there isn't much of it out there you know, is it the case of uh, who's using it? And I had the chance to go to the National Worm Composting Conference for three years in a row that uh, is uh, hosted there at NC State. And I think they're in their 15th or 16th year now and uh, got to be around some of the very large composters and see what they were doing and, uh, you know, realize that part of that market is the uh, – Medicinal herb growers have uh, the, the money to spend on worm compost and are, are very excited about investing in that. So, um, but it's, is worm composting practical for the farm? Because I've seen a lot of people kill worms in uh, bins and I've done it myself. And uh, it's, should I be recommending this to people? And the short answer is, is I think we've seen enough methods and things that work to say, yes, that this is something that could be done simply on, simply on farms. and now, after five years of doing this, uh, we're in the mode of really needing to get the explanations out there. There are some information that's available at my, you know, website. So, but what I what I'd really like to what I'd really like to ask about John is 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 it worth it? I mean, you know, yes, you can do it on farm, but but is the is the value really there in in going in in taking that extra step to to actually do the worm, the vermicompost production on your own on the farm. Yeah. And I guess part of that, uh, the corollary question to that is what is, what does the vermicompost do for you that the regular compost doesn't like, why would I, why would I want to buy that extra stuff? I mean, you said that the medicinal herb growers are interested in it, but, but why would, why would I as a vegetable grower be interested in it? And then, and then, and then the cost issues aside, is there, is there value to doing it on farm or, 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 um, and and then and then let's get into to the actual how you do it. Okay, so those I think what we're doing is trying to answer both those questions in parallel. Um, the first question was probably the priority more was is the worm compost you know worth that much more? And you know we can approach that by looking at the fertility. Like people will say worm compost has seven to ten times more fertility in it, and that would be mostly incorrect in that you know the statement that was made long time ago was is that the the worm castings in the lining of a tunnel in the soil you know have maybe seven to ten times more nutrients than the surrounding soil so that is has a good chance of being true and that was what was intended many years ago when that statement was made but it sometimes gets morphed into that worm compost that's seven to ten times you know more nutrients than regular compost and that's not likely because it really has to do with the feedstocks that go in the worms can't you know miraculously 
you know, make there be more nutrients there, although they can influence how available it is. But the other question has a lot to do with the microorganisms that would be in the worm compost. And are they different? Are they better uh, for use in compost teas? And I've, one of my things that I've been in is involved in is uh, the, the compost tea project here on campus. And you know, we make the compost more and, and they make the teas. Um, although Brooke, who's working with me on the PhD, she started in that project and is still trying to stay connected to that. And uh, so far, I haven't seen anything, you know, from our research that the worm composts are that much different or that they're different, but are they that much better? Um, we're not seeing that yet, but still asking that question. But to do a good job asking that question, I feel like you need to know exactly what you have with the worm compost. So you know, my nature is rather than go out and get worm compost from somebody, you know, we wanted to be able to make the worm compost and then have more impact over how it's made and, you know, what stages of that. So that was part of what moved us to looking at how to make it is to be able to better address this question of is it that much difference but short answer right now is there are some differences in the nutrients and the release and the microbiology that's present but i don't know if it's worth the extra work and the, the time that's involved i'm pretty confident you could find people that would disagree with that and say that yes it's clearly better and uh, that's but that's what we're trying to convince ourselves some people i know one guy who sells you know he's the biggest worm compost maker in the country i think and you know one of the, he's selling a lot to greenhouse growers and a lot of what they're looking for is the nitrate nitrogen that's there and in a well-managed worm composting system you can move more of the nitrogen into the nitrate form which is available and um but you can also do that with regular composting if you know how and if you allow it to get mature enough it's just the worms seem to help move that maturity process along particularly under the conditions that he's doing it in, but it doesn't always happen that way. So it's understanding these variables of when things do and don't. But So let's get into the basics of does this work on a farm? And um, I need to want to tell the story that uh, quite a while ago, more than 10 years ago, I had uh, someone who wanted to get some uh, compost from us uh, for their garden. It was a good connection, and that person eventually ended up being the uh, head of the Michigan Department of Agriculture, and he was just trying to learn about some of this stuff, and his wife was somewhat motivating him to consider the compost. So he came, and I picked up a bucket full of the compost uh, with the loader and dumped it into his trailer, and as I did, I saw all these worms in there and that I hadn't noticed before, and you know, as he went to go, he said, did, it, did I want him to pay him? pay me for the compost. And I said, no, that's fine. Just take it. And, but it was the next day I realized that I probably gave away like a hundred dollars worth of worms there, all <laughs> those worms. And I went back and started looking at the pile and they were there in our horse and llama manure piles. And I just hadn't paid much attention to that. And so at that point I started managing the piles more to move the worms through there. Uh, fortunate that Patty Part of her therapy is she spends uh, time out in the paddock picking up all the horse poop and putting it in a pile for me. And so then I manage it and get it composted and we put it and put it back on the pastures. But in these piles that were maybe 10 yards or more, the worms would survive fine through the winter and, uh, you know, no special treatment or anything. And so it was I started taking worms from there and brought them into my hoop house and said, asked the question of would the worms survive in the hoop house just like the vegetables survive in the hoop house by using the interior covers to keep things from freezing and the answer was yes they did and i pitched that to the university as an alternative to composting all the food scraps and so we built the hoop house and we started doing the worm composting in the hoop house and um, they did you know every year they've survived fine but it's still the question in my mind is, do you need to have a hoop house in order to do the worm composting through the winter? Uh, I don't, I think the answer is no, that you can do it outside. And I'm trying to come up with the methods to do it outside, but also the methods to do it inside. So we started with a mentality of a, of a bin, you know, that you got to put food in and bury it. 
But on a large scale basis, that's just not practical to be going in and burying food on a routine basis. So, you know, you start looking at how to do that. And I find that many of the large scale worm composters are pre-composting the material. And then you can just put it on top and you don't have to bury it. And you get rid of a lot of the fruit fly issues and you get rid of um, some of the issues of uh, cooking the worms. And, you know, we learned that one way to avoid cooking the worms was to have a big pile and only feed part of the pile, which works very well. Um, but it's still, how do you harvest the material quickly? And I'm going to try to describe this wedge system that we've done, you know, both inside and I've done it here with my horse manure piles outside. And um, let's start within the hoop house. We, let's say we have a wall that's uh, three or four cinder blocks high. And we start with the worms and the uh, material to be composted in a long row. We have a 40-foot wind. It's like a windrow of sorts there, but it's up against a wall. And each time we feed it, in the beginning, we're just making it taller. And we get it up to about, you know, the, the third, second or third block. And then we start sloping it, you know, so it's at about a 45-degree angle out from the uh, wall. And this is where the term, you know, the wedge system comes in. And it's in the literature. It's been around for a while. Just not too many people have used it. So we build this up and keep building up. Each week, all we do is come in once a week and put a, a layer of two to three inches, um, sometimes a little less than that, on the that edge. And then we just keep moving the pile, let's say, from left to right um, and making it wider. The worms, most of them move into that fresh material within a few days, and uh, you have to keep the moisture right, And uh, but they have a place to retreat if it gets too hot or something's not right about that. They you know go back into the other compost, which is really important, that they have a place to retreat. So whether it's you know for protection from moisture or temperature or other factors. Okay, so now let's say we keep moving this and we feed this wedge all through the winter. Let's say the first time we did it, we started it in August or so, got it really built up and we moved it all through the winter. And now we're coming into the spring and the worm wedge or this bed of composted material is about five or six feet wide. So what we do is go back over on the block side and move the blocks aside and drop things down and then start that material that's finished drying out. Most of the worms have moved out, but there's still a few worms in there, and they will move out as it dries. And then it also gives a chance for the cocoons that are in that material to move out. One of the things we're avoiding is all the work of putting the material through a screener to get the worms out, and plus all the stress that that puts on the worms. And that's what right. many people are doing now to try to move out the worms. So we're saving a lot of time by not moving the worms. We just keep moving them with the feed. Now the key is, is as we get that material that's on the left side against the block wall dug out, which in this particular system, we're doing it by hand and we're breaking it and breaking it up and drying it out. And then we do put it through a screener so that we can get it uniform for sale. But eventually we end up with a, a path that's on the back side of this. We set the cinder blocks back up and we keep harvesting from there. All right, so now the worms are, let's say, six feet away from the cinder block wall, and we have a big open space now over against the cinder blocks. So what we do is before we feed, we take that front face that is full of all the worms with a pitchfork, and we just scoop up all the worms, and we throw them, reach over top of the pile and back over and put them back against the cinder block wall. Right. And then we do that for several weeks with feeding the front face again and just keep moving the worms out, moving the worms out, and then moving them back. And essentially, we start to cycle over again. All right. So, yeah, that can be done on that scale. And we can produce a pretty lot of worm compost quickly, certainly way more than what's needed to do just the transplants on a farm. I mean, we have simpler systems for smaller uh, needs. but this is allowing us to produce, you know, 10 yards of material that you can do a lot with that, including sell it for income. Um, so to finish this thought is what if you wanted to do it on a bigger scale? And I actually changed the way I do my horse manure pile this year. I used to have a windrow and I would keep adding the fresh material 
to the end, the length end of the windrow and keep moving them down and then harvest out stuff from the back. And then I said, well, I just need to do what I'm doing, you know, in the hoop house. So I had the long windrow and I kept feeding the face of the windrow. So the, the back of the windrow was close to a fence and I kept moving them out. And I was more like 10, 12 feet away from the fence, but all the worms were over on that side. I was able to come in now because all the worms were out of the backside that was against the fence and just pick it up with my loader and just take it and move it. And I moved a pile that was 15, 20 yards of material and, you know, half an hour to an hour. I just moved it uh, 20 feet or so to another area. And there were very, very few worms in that material. So I cleaned up that area along the fence then. And then I just took my loader and pushed the pile with all the worms in it, you know, back over against the fence and just started over again. And it took me like five years to get back to the old thing where I started was, is that, hey, this is just kind of taking care of itself without doing much work. And so now I have some windrows set up on campus with the free composted food scraps leaves that last summer we had a pretty big windrow it's close to 20 yards now and i put probably 70 pounds of worms into it and uh, trying to get this system working outside and it does have uh, a felt cover on it and it has uh, a mobile hoop house over top of it but the ends on this mobile hoop house are open so it's just keeping some of the rain off and um, it's last week when i no when did i check it on monday you know it was 60 degrees um, granted, we've had not normal weather now, warmer than normal, but uh, the other pile that I have that's food scraps that were composted last fall that's outside, it's running, you know, 80, 90 degrees. So by using the heat of the composting correctly and having a big enough windrow that the worms can move in and out of it, depending on what's going on, it's pretty easy to keep the worms alive and you know at home my horse manure piles out there right now are i'm sure are 120 130 on the front edge and the worms are just back behind there um you know figuring that out and it's i, I can't really take too much credit because i can show you the book from 1959 you know raising worms for profit that you know he describes you know how he kept the worms alive in a cold climate by adding horse manure and allowing certain things to freeze, but just keeping the worms outside. And uh, from what I've read, you know, I think the Chinese are doing something similar with their worm composting. So you've got the ideas now. What I really need to do now is put this in a format that's easy to share with the farmers. I, I did it last year at the uh, Moses conference, and uh, we had a couple hundred people in the room, and I got some feedback from people that they, you know, liked what I said, and we're going to try it. So it's, I, I think the potential there is to do the worm composting at a relatively low cost because you can grow your worm populations without having to buy all of them and have something different. It still doesn't answer the question of, you know, is this stuff that much better? Uh, there's clearly a lot of people that would say yes, but, you know, is there the good type of research, which we come back to our earlier question of, you know, how do you do the research to really be clear you know, of whether this stuff is better or not? And that would be a case where I really do think we need some good replicated trials to, to help us figure that out. But uh, that's coming, I think. John, we're going to take a break here and get a word from our sponsors, and we'll be right back. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Vermont Compost Company, makers of Fort V and Fort Light potting mixes. When you buy potting mix from Vermont Compost Company, you're not just buying an input. You're joining a community of growers across the United States. And like the best inputs and the best communities, you're getting a product and a community that really have your back. Vermont Compost Company has been committed to helping farmers make money by growing great transplants for over 20 years. If you've got questions or need help with your transplants, whether you've got questions about watering, temperatures, troubleshooting, growing conundrums, you you can call them up and you can actually talk to Carl Hammer, the founder and owner of the company. And Carl knows his stuff. And about that community, Vermont Compost keeps track of who gets every batch of potting soil they create. And because Vermont Compost deals directly with growers without going through a distributor, they know who's using their potting soils and how they're using them. Vermont Compost Company knows, like I do, that organic growers are some of the best people on the planet. They're proud to be part of that community. Taking care of growers by taking care of transplants since 1992. VermontCompost.com. 
bandwidth for the Farmer to Farmer podcast is provided by BCS America. A BCS two-wheel tractor is the only power equipment a market gardener will need with PTO-driven attachments like the rototiller, flail mower, power harrow, rotary plow, snow thrower, log splitter, and more. You name it, and you can probably run it with a versatile BCS two-wheel tractor. The first time I used a rototiller way back in 1991, it was mounted to a BCS two-wheel tractor, and it spoiled me for life. When you get behind a BCS, you can tell that it's built to the same commercial standards as four-wheeled farm tractors. I've used other tillers and mowers, and I spent most of the time when I was using them thinking of how much easier it would be with a BCS. On my own farm, we went through a number of so-called solutions before we finally got smart and bought one for ourselves. Even though we owned a four-wheel tractor to manage our 20 acres of vegetables, the BCS tackled jobs that we couldn't do with the larger machine, from mowing steep slopes and around trees to working in our high tunnels. Check out bcsamerica.com to see the full lineup of tractors and attachments. So, John, with that, I'd, I'd like to take a pivot and talk some about um, about transplant production. And because, you know, we're, we're getting on to the season here, people are going to start turning on their, their greenhouses before too long. And uh, up here in the north, and I imagine in some places they're already up and running. Um, and that's something you have a lot of experience with. So can you maybe start off by telling us what, what do you, as you see it, what are the critical components of doing transplant production? Good. So one of the key places to start is something that I would bring, I bring, brought from my greenhouse background is, is that something that I learned to do is about writing an action plan. And it's, it's part of the bigger picture of, you know, doing business planning or doing strategic planning where you come up with your goals and your objectives. But to do it right, you need to really sit down and have a clear plan, you know, that says, what are you going to do? You know, when is it going to happen and who's responsible? And I use that when I do workshops on transplants and there's a handout on it on uh, my web page that you can download on developing a transplant action plan and you know this idea is true for everything on the farm but i think it's particularly important for transplants that you have a clear idea of how many you need you know and are you going to be able to grow them on farm or does it make more sense to buy them or which ones can you grow and which ones you know can you buy but you know figure that out well in advance and, uh, you know, like we give recommendations of, you know, produce five or 10 percent overage. And how do you, you know, prepare? Uh, how do you get your schedules ready so that you have stuff to plant out? And for many of us now, it's having early stuff that goes into the tunnels. So many people have already started their transplant production. You know, the first week of January, uh, two weeks ago, I sowed my first seeds from my, my hoop house at home and shifted them up already last week and they're in growing under some fluorescent lights and if the weather goes well they can start going out in early february into the hoop house if not you may have to hold them till later february but um having that plan is number one all right and that plan would include you know how many seeds do you need you know your your schedule but then what are you going to use for growing containers uh what's your system going to be what's your media going to be what's your fertility going to be and also, what your pest management is going to be, what do you think might show up? You know, do you have a plan if aphids show up? Because if, if you don't do something, the very first aphid that you see, you're, you know, just asking for trouble. If you say, oh, I'll get that tomorrow. It's like aphids, there's a good probability they might show up. And if you deal with it right away, you know, you're likely not, you can stop a problem, you know, very early. So having a part of the pest management plan. But how do how do you recommend dealing with aphids? Uh, one is keeping your fertility, you know, reasonable, and you know your plants growing at a reasonable rate. Uh, my observation tend to fit with what a lot of other farmers have said. If you get that fertility up high, you increase the probability of aphids. Uh, the other key thing is thinking about exclusion. Where do they come from? Uh, I had some great stuff. I started. Uh, in November, I wanted to try some microgreens under my lights since I didn't get much going in my hoop house last fall because of being busy with the wedding that we had here. And um, I brought in uh, a sweet potato that I had outside that had been in a jar of water and, and had survived in the hoop house. And I put it under the lights there and 
hang up that sweet potato. The aphids didn't come off of that sweet potato and move on to all my other stuff. And uh, I didn't do my take my own advice and do something right away. And so, you know, excluding them is a big thing. And then having a plan that if you have to do something, you know, sometimes water and and or soap, you know, as a way of washing them when it's just a small population can be effective. Uh, in the case of transplants, just going out and squishing them with my fingers, you know, when they first start, because usually they're relatively contained when they start. You know, but then having, you know, some choice of material uh, that you can spray if necessary uh, to keep them from spreading if all those other methods didn't uh, work. So which you know, might be pyganic or it might be one of the other materials that can uh, help knock the aphids down. But predators and in introducing them in the case of transplants is, uh, in the case of aphids, I think they're actually, you know, can be successful, particularly when the temperatures are cold outside and releasing something like ladybugs that they'll stay in the greenhouse or in the growing area. Uh, they do work a little slower at the lower temperatures, but my observation has been that they, they can, you know, keep uh, aphid population in check even with lower temperatures. The trick we found on our farm was actually to to introduce those on a schedule. So we'd actually buy a, a whole good bug blend from um, from Hydro Gardens out in Colorado, and I'll include a link to that in the show notes. But we we'd get that it was a it was a diversity of stuff. So it had ladybugs, but it also had some some parasites and and other things in there. And we just put that out two weeks after we turned on the greenhouse and and kind of let them do a search and destroy. And hopefully, you know, the idea was we never we never wanted to see an aphid. We wanted them to see the aphids first because they're probably better at looking for them than I am. And uh, and we would then sometimes if if we did that actually early enough, then we might come back in with another round of ape, another round of that that same good bug pack, you know, four weeks later because we went, we didn't have the kind of food supplies that that we were counting that that those insects would need. We were hoping that they were going to wipe out the aphids and then starve to death, and then we'd bring in some more. So. That was something we found worked really well with the beneficials was not to wait until we had a problem. Right. Get them out there. And, and that's the, the banker plan approach. My colleague, Matt Greisip, uh, is an entomologist, has been uh, working on that from a greenhouse perspective. And I've had the chance to be on uh, his students' uh, committees and you know, looking at different feeder systems and putting out piles or not putting out piles, particularly as it relates to thrips and you know they found out that actually some of the predators you put out a mix of predators and the, the predators start eating the other predators and so that oh. <laughs> so that was not very well known it was an important contribution that they're you know working on making is to help people see that you don't set up uh, competing predator systems um, but uh, it, it it certainly can work so when when you when you go out to farms that are doing transplant production what are some of the common mistakes that you see or, or some of the things that you see maybe that people could be doing better Okay, so one, let's think about the, uh, you know, what what's really driving the system. And, you know, due to my background in nature, I'd like to talk about fertility. But I think we really need to start with the light and the temperature thing that uh, optimizing or maximizing light is a really important thing, that your greenhouse uh, covering is clean and that you're not shading things and that you're getting the plants as much light as possible if you have a greenhouse. Uh, I learned pretty early on I, when I started talking at uh, the farming conferences all those years ago, I, I kind of made this bad assumption that everybody had a greenhouse and then learned that a lot of people are starting inside under fluorescent lights. So if you are using lights inside, then it's again having the lights really close to the plants in order to get as much light as possible. Um, but at the same time, being aware that lights close to the plants are going to mean a lot of heat and potentially damage there so that you've got to manage those two things together, um, whether you're doing it under uh, supplemental light sources or artificial light sources, or whether you're doing it with light in the greenhouse. And like if you maximize light in the greenhouse, you can end up with those higher temperatures and uh, allowing the temperatures to get up real high during the day and then drop down at night. You know, we know from our understanding of the DIF, the DIF, the difference between day and night temperature, that when you have those real high day temperatures and cool night temperatures that the transplants are gonna stretch more. And you can use that to your advantage if you need taller transplants, but mostly we're trying to keep the transplants short and stocky. 
So, you know, that's best done by keeping a light intensity up and if necessary, you know, borrow or get a light meter so that you can find out what your light intensities are. And then, you know, managing your temperatures and knowing that your temperature is going to influence this time. Like we have this standard, you can look in a catalog or, you know, that, you know, it's going to take so many weeks. Well, that's dependent on temperature. And I, it seems like more growers now are aware, but I'll, I'll share this, the idea that you can start earlier in the season and run your greenhouse cooler, okay, and put in less energy that way and have your transplants take longer. Or you can wait and start your transplants a little bit later in the season and have your greenhouse warmer and have the production time a little bit shorter. Uh, I think there's a number of factors that come into play there, you know, how insulated your greenhouse is and how you're heating it and how much time do you have, you know, if you're off in Florida enjoying the beach or, you know, on a cruise and, you, you know, you don't have to come back as early, then you might start a little later and run a little warmer. Uh, if you're home anyway and need something to do, you start a little bit sooner. But understanding how light and temperature come into play is something that I think almost all transplant growers can continue to work on, uh, including spacing. You know, that spacing is another factor that really influences light and influences the height of the plants and making sure they have adequate space and adequate airflow. So inadequate humidity management, and that comes in again more to the shoot environment of uh, ventilating if necessary. We tend to think more about trapping the heat in, and uh, that's okay if it's dry, but if you start getting a lot of condensation, there's something to be said for later in the day, uh, venting some of that warm, moist air and turning on the heat and drying things out a little bit. Uh, you're using some more energy, but you're potentially saving from diseases and other issues that might come. So that would be first where I'd start. And then when it comes to the uh, thinking about the root zone more, it's really making that decision about your fighting media. Um, you know, you've been a you know good proponent and of helping people to remember that, you know, just how important that potting media is. And uh, if you're not sure how to do that, that investing in buying in a good potting media is a, definitely a good investment that uh, it can save you money in the long term. Um, but there are also people that want to make your own potting media, which I tend to be in that camp of trying to help people do that. So if you're going to do that, you know, then it's really a matter of understanding what your components are going to be. Uh, I put a lot of emphasis on trying to make the compost so that it's a uh, proper particle size and stability. You know, not using immature compost is you know, probably the best advice anybody needs starting out that if you're going to try to do this, you really need uh, mature compost, things that Elliot Coleman and others have been saying for years, you know, let it be, you know, 8, 10, 12, 16 months old so that you can be confident of it. Um, what else do we want to say there? You know, getting that media mixed so that it's going to hold enough water but not hold too much water. Again, that's the skill that a, a commercial blender can bring to you so that, you know, you're going to have that good water holding and good aeration capacity. Otherwise, you've got to figure out how to get that yourself. Uh, realizing that a lot of the air holding capacity, that air and water holding capacity, though, is Part of it's with the media, but a big part of it is with the, the person holding the hose and that you really have to do a good job of watering carefully. Uh, started out many, 30 years ago doing research on bedding plants. And, you know, what I was taught in school was, you know, when you water, you water thoroughly so that some water drips out the bottom. And to be honest, that doesn't really apply for most transplant situations that, um, the way most commercial bedding plant growers do is they're watering frequently, lightly. Uh, they are, you have to be careful that you don't have soluble salts and excess nutrients building up, but frequent light watering tends to keep the plants uh, a little shorter, uh, a little stockier, and uh, less prone to diseases. If you're farming and you're really busy and you're not a greenhouse manager, that may not work for you if you're not there multiple times a day. So you have to find that balance between 
Right. Can you be out there watering them at uh, maybe twice a day instead of just once a day or once every other day? Right. Those are decisions that you make and you balance it out with your media, you know, and with the hose. You know, that water is a very important regulator of growth in these systems. Drying things out can be okay as long as your growing media or substrate doesn't have too much soluble salts. And, you know, that's a risk with some of the folks that are manufacturing potting media these days is trying to get the idea of, you know, everything that the plant needs is going to be in there for six to eight weeks. And I think that can be done, but it can also be done to an extreme where there's too much nutrients in there. And then if you dry things out a little bit, your roots get damaged and then you start down a cycle of having diseased roots and diseased plants. So how do we deal with that? To, I wish I could come up. And one of the things that I would like to come up with is uh, a low cost uh, EC or soluble salts meter. Um, what I use is a meter that uh, costs about $400 and I'm able to stick it directly into the moist media and get a reading of the electrical conductivity or the soluble salts. Uh, that meter is available from a company called the Spectrum Technologies who has been providing you know, equipment and testing equipment for farmers for many, many years. And with that, it's like it's so helpful. Maybe I can use a specific example that this summer, for the wedding, I was growing a bunch of hanging baskets for use in the tent, and then I was growing uh, sunflowers for uh, the bouquets and things. And I was growing the sunflowers in bulb crates lined with a landscape fabric and then with a mixture of compost and peat that I made. And I was trying an idea. I put in 18 plants in each one where normally they say like a sunflower would be six by six you know i had them in you know a one foot by two foot tray i had 18 plants and they actually grew to be over three feet tall and quite good and but it was around week six or so that they started they clearly needed some help they were getting hungry so i took some of my two-year-old horse manure compost and a five gallon bucket of that and put it in a half 50 gallon barrel then I put in a bucket of rainwater and I mixed it up and I checked at the conductivity and it was like at uh, five, which I know to put something on, I wanted to be around two or so that I would have nutrients without nuking things. So I kept putting in each get a five gallon bucket, but, you know, when I put in two, it went from uh, five to four and then it went from four to I think. 3.25 and then it went down to 2.5 and when i put in the fifth bucket of water it went down to two and i put that on the plants and everything you know greened up over the next seven to ten days and everything finished fine and it's like we can use the compost but it's difficult to know just what's there you know unless you can have some measure and soluble salts is the best way to do that um we just you can get a hundred dollar meter and do that but it, it's not going to be a direct read meter so that that's an area where i think we can do some more research to help farmers you know learn how to use a measure of soluble salts to know what's there and whether they need more or not and uh, the whole goal is to prevent farmers from having to buy uh, fish emulsion or other off-farm resources now uh, this is one of the key reasons for making this worm compost because uh, what we've been doing for a number of years is taking our flats and when they start to show that signs of slowing down is taking somewhere between one to two cups of the nicely screened worm compost and sprinkling it over the flat. I can sprinkle it over the flat as fast as I can water the flat with fish emulsion or with something else and just water that in and you see in a pretty immediate response and you know, I've been showing pictures like that for a number of years now how you know these on-farm composts can be made and then used to provide this fertility and avoid the use of having to buy water soluble materials. So John, before we turn to the lightning round, you've got a lot of things going on with Michigan State University that are educational programs that are available to farmers, both for people that want to be on site as well as, as well as people to tap in remotely. Yes. We're trying to think about how much time farmers have and what they can invest in. So there's your you know, standard farm conference workshops that uh, 
are available, and I certainly enjoy going and presenting there. But when it comes to going more in depth, uh, working on the online courses, I've been teaching three of them for five years now, one on the hoop houses, uh, one on the compost, and one on the transplants. And uh, been working with Adam Montry since this time last year, we've introduced the high tunnel course. Uh, I think it's high tunnels and hoop houses for farm success. So that is set up to run for six weeks with uh, access to the information for eight weeks. And uh, each week there are recorded presentations that people can listen to on their own time uh, through uh, the course management system at MSU that's called the uh, D2L, but you, you get a password and you log in. Uh, the cost of those, we're really trying to keep uh, as low as we can. Um, that course for the students on campus would cost uh, $450 for a one credit course. And uh, we're making it available for the non-credits uh, for $150. And uh, you know that is seven hours, I think, six or seven hours of recorded material. So and when you look at the price of webinars and things, uh, we think it's a really good value. And then uh, Adam is also doing weekly online uh, meetings for those that want to take advantage of those. We're finding that maybe only five out of 50 are get on each week. So either people don't have time or they're not comfortable with the technology. We're still trying to figure out what the answer there. Is. But, uh, looking forward to being able to introduce the, uh, the compost course and the transplant course in the future. Um, I'm going to be piloting, I think, the compost course with a group of uh, com people working on composting out of Detroit, which is another place that we do a fair amount of training. I'm fortunate to work with uh, Keep Growing Detroit and do, uh, we just scheduled four workshops over the year uh, where I go down to Detroit and offer uh, you know, two hour or longer presentations there. So then we have uh, the Organic Farmer Training Program is the nine month in-depth, you know, full-time program that is uh, run through the Student Organic Farm and information is available about that at the uh, student organic farm website which uh, you can provide a link to that's uh, msuorganicfarm.org and uh, we're still i think they're still accepting applications for that uh, typically it's a class of around 15 or 16 participants who uh, work together to run the farm all year including doing uh, rotations where they're part they might do six weeks where they're really focused on the csa six weeks where they're focused on the farm stand six weeks where they're focused on transplants six weeks where they're focused on the animals and then where we have the uh, poultry uh, swine and beef and then uh, they get uh, a field and a high tunnel that are part of their uh, responsibility and so it's very much a hands-on learning process you, let's see what else. You also uh, had Colin Thompson on and talked about the Upper Peninsula Farm, which uh, super excited about there. And there we have uh, the Farmer Apprentice uh, Program, which is uh, it's an incubator farm program where there's a quarter acre sites available and uh, for a very reasonable price and getting the support of the land and the equipment in Colin. And uh, we've had our first person through the program and she will be continuing this year. And I think there's two more that have been accepted. We have the potential to have up to six uh, apprentices there. So, uh, you know, that continues to be an opportunity that I'd invite people to look into. Um, if you think you want to come and check out the UP in the farm, uh, my understanding is, is that on July 30th, that there's going to be a, a big hoo-ha uh, up in the UP to celebrate all the things that have been happening with local food and that uh, Elliot Coleman and Barbara Damrosh are going to come and be a part of the program. Uh, so that's still uh, in the final planning phases, but uh, I think that's going to be July 30th. And amazing things happen there in the UP with the UP Food Exchange and uh, the farmers and uh, boy, some of the business CSAs and uh, the, the tribal involvements. It's, it's super exciting. Uh, and, you know, we're working on grazing up there and holistic management. And uh, the, the UP is going to is the up and coming place. Believe it or not, there are people retiring 
you know, to the UP because uh, it has what they want. So it's definitely something different than Florida, but uh, we're meeting a lot of people that are coming to the farm that want homesteading. And there we have the uh, what we call the Skill Seekers Program, and uh, where we're doing, uh, Colin is doing one and two hour workshops uh, over the course of the year for people that just want a little bit of training. Uh, I'm also working on a program that uh, I'm not sure if the university, we're going to get it through the university here in time, but it's called the Novice Farmer Training Program, which will be two semesters of online courses. So starting in the fall, take nine credits, three courses, and then three, uh, courses in the spring, which would include the uh, an organic farming class that I teach that will move online, uh, the poop house course, the transplant course, and the compost course, and a bunch of compost courses, and then the chance to be on the farm there in the UP for uh, the whole summer. Very cool. Is there a centralized spot where we can go to get links to all of that? The MSU farm has about the, the organic farmer training program, the North Farm, in which I believe that's the actual uh, website, the North Farm dot MSU dot EDU, uh, you know, that they can get all the stuff about that's happening in the UP. And then uh, my particular web page through the horticulture department, which is, you know, HRT dot MSU dot EDU backslash John J O H N dash Birnbaum B I E R N B A U M. I have lots of different things. So I have uh, information about closing the food cycle loop and uh, about hot composting, uh, some good information about worm composting that I'm hoping to update soon, but uh, uh, that we're putting that up there. We have uh, how to do your transplant action plan. Uh, the talk that I gave for e-organic on uh, how to do organic fertility management of transplants is linked there. What else is there? A bunch of stuff about cold cellars. The hoop house is just part of the equation. Having the cold cellar is the other real big equation for uh, local food. So there's a few sites to go to. So so let's turn to the lightning round, John. What's your favorite tool on the farm? I would say that I have an emotional attachment to the scythe. And uh, in part from uh, the time that I spent with my grandfather many years ago, you know, getting to be involved with uh, him and building the, the first uh, greenhouse down there in North Carolina. And uh, so when I get a chance, if I ever get to go to garage sales or uh, this summer, actually, they did a auction right down the street for me. And I have like seven or eight old size and plus they have a Johnny size and but I think it also has a lot of potential for the composting that I'm doing. I'm trying to show folks in Detroit that, you know, empty fields, you know, if they're not contaminated, that are just on the farm. You know, we're going out and harvesting grass, you know, from our farm and mixing it with the leaves and then making a bunch of different recipes and showing how you can do that. So the, the scythe is my friend, but, you know, the other one I got to make a pitch for that has saved my body is the uh, uh, my tractor. I've got a 26 horsepower John Deere 4200 with a loader and I love rocks. I have kind of a passion for moving rocks and I'm lucky that on my property there's a lot of rocks that I could dig up and <laughs> move and uh, that's one of my therapies is uh, managing you know rocks and making stuff with them and uh, so that the tractor has saved my body there but also for making compost and then for the using the spreader and spreading compost so I have to make a pitch for the tractor or so it, it, it continues to be good to me. That's great. And a favorite crop to grow? So many different things that I've grown all these greenhouse crops and stuff. And I was like, how am I going to answer that? And what I ended up coming to was what made me the happiest when I was growing it. And I've had the chance to grow uh, what we'll call the four sacred herbs, the tobacco, sweetgrass, sage, and cedar and uh, give those to folks. And those are the things I think that where I feel the most connected and the, uh, you know, the most give and take with. And it's like I, for a while there, years ago, I was probably one of the biggest tobacco growers in Michigan, just, uh, you know, but not for smoking, but for ceremonial use. And, you know, this, I've got a big sweet grass plot and uh, those are some plants that I throw out there for people to think about that, uh, how we, use these plants not but for food but for the fragrance the you know the medicinal herbs has been a place that i've been able to learn and and these things can 
uh, help us in a lot of different ways. So we'll say the sweet grass and sage, you know, are two good things to look into. And if you could go back in time and tell yourself one thing when you were getting started in this whole business, what would it be? I'm looking forward to giving this answer and I hope that young beginning farmers are listening. It's about taking what I would do better or what is to take better care of my body. Um, number one thing is wear ear or hearing protection. Uh, as I'm trying to get myself back into better shape here and getting back to meditation, it's very annoying to have that ringing in my ears all the time, which I've had for maybe not all the time, but I have it a lot and it's been there a long time. I did lawn mowing, you know, when I was a kid and chainsawing and all this stuff without hearing protection. So I'll say it again, wear hearing protection all the time on the tractor. You don't think it's necessary right now, but uh, you'll thank uh, me later in life, you know, when you don't have the ringing in your ears. And, you know, the other part of taking care of your body was, is, you know, I spent too many hours on the computer here and, and doing stuff and not taking care of myself and finally had to break down three and a half years ago and go to the chiropractor and start doing yoga. And I can't be happy, any happier or any, you know, give any better advice than a, you know, a yoga class that uh, gets you into protecting your body and being more considerate of your body and extending and expanding, you know, from your brain into your body by using your breath. Uh, try it, boy. It, it, uh, I, I wish I had been introduced to that, you know, as a young person. Um, but I'm happy that I have been introduced to it now. It's it's made all the difference in the world and my quality of life. I, I think it's a really important message. John, thank you so much for being on the Farmer to Farmer podcast today. It's been a pleasure. And thank you so much for all that you're doing and the, the things that we're getting to learn from all these folks and uh, look forward to continuing to listen. All right, so wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 51 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast, and you can find the notes for this show at farmertofarmerpodcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Birnbaum. That's B-I-E-R-N-B-A-U-M. If you enjoy the podcast, be sure to check out my weekly newsletter, The Flying Rutabaga. The Flying Rutabaga runs the gamut from practical templates for delegation to guidelines for watering transplants. You can sign up at farmertofarmerpodcast.com or purplepitchfork.com. Also, if you enjoy the show, it would be great if you would pop on over to iTunes and leave us a review or make a comment on the show notes or tell your friends on Facebook. These reviews and referrals are the bread and butter of making this show available to an ever wider group of listeners. And you know what else? I'd love to hear your suggestions for guests on the show. I know a lot of things, but I know that I don't know all of the great farmers out there. Please visit farmertofarmerpodcast.com and use the contact form to tell me who you'd like to hear from. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running. Music.